Okay. So thank you all for coming to the first CTA seminar of the new year. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our first speaker of this year, Emmanuel uh, Fuliteo. Uh, he's going to talk about the uh, generic realizability for intuitionist, uh, intuitionistic set theory. So could you start? Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So I'm gonna be speaking on generic realizability. And I wanna start with some sort of introduction, then I'm I want to review some of the applications, and then I will show you some new work joined with hyperlatin. Uh, by the way, generic here has nothing to do with forcing uh, set theory, although there are certain similarities. We'll see that in a moment. So let me start with some general remark. Uh, it is safe to say that uh, every realizability notion is modeled upon the BHK application. Now this name was coined by Tretram and uh, it refers to similar explanations of intuitionistic logic by Haitin and Kolmogor. So this is now- excuse, excuse me, I'm not hearing very well. Uh, I, I, I hear you very far away. Maybe you, you need to be a little bit closer to a mic or something, I don't know. Can you hear me now better? Is it better now? Yes, it's better. Okay. So, um, so my claim that every realizability has to do with BHK is uh, in part not entirely true, at least historically. In fact, uh, Kleene did not have in mind the uh, height in you know, Kolmogorov, but it was inspired by Hilbert somehow. Anyway, uh, the idea is that the proposition formula phi is true if there is a proof. And uh, proofs are defined uh, by recursion on phi according to these clauses. So a proof of a conjunction is a pair of proofs, a proof of phi and the proof of psi. A proof of a disjunction is essentially a proof of one of the two plus a tag saying which one. And the interesting case is the implication. So a proof here is some kind of function that takes a proof of phi into a proof of psi. And uh, when it comes to quantifiers, you also need uh, some domain so that a proof of uh, for all is again a function that takes an element x of the domain and returns a proof of phi of x. And finally, for the existential, you have a pair xp, where x is in the domain, and b is a proof of phi of x. So if you want to make this precise, you can use a partial combinatorial algebra as your set of proofs. And in particular, you have a partial binary operation, so that now it makes sense to apply a proof to another proof. And then you define a BHK-like relation between elements of the PCA and formulas. When uh, formalized, you usually get soundness results of the following form. So if phi is provable, then the interpretation of phi is provable. And uh, along the way, you might interpret extra principles, like uh, in S. Now, the usual applications are consistency, independence, and conservation plan, plus some other property properties such as uh, closure under certain rules, existing property, etc. I want to give you the usual example, which is cleaning recursive realizability. So this is an interpretation of arithmetic, and it's basically BHK based on cleaning first algebra. So natural numbers with Turing partial application that gives you a PCA. And there's nothing much to say about uh, the definition here. It's just BHK. So let me just point out that uh, atomic formulas don't need a proof, so to speak. And the domain of the interpretation is omega. So for instance, uh, a proof of for all n is a recursive function that on input n outputs a proof of phi of n. Now, there is also a variant with truth. And the idea is that uh, you want to have an interpretation 
a realizability that implies truth, that realizes only true formulas. So formally, you can show that if phi is realizable, then it's true. And uh, for that, in the case of clean recursive realizability, you need just to change some clauses. Now, the details are not important. Anyway, both interpretations are sound. And indeed, from a proof of uh, phi, you can actually find effectively two natural numbers witnessing the, the interpretation. Now, let me say, okay, these are some of the applications of Clini realizability. So consistency with church thesis. So everything is computable. The closure under the corresponding rule. So if you prove uh, that uh, you have a sort of total relation, then uh, it's computable. There is a computable choice function. And finally, the disjunction and the existence property. These are one of some of the properties that you look for in, a, in an intuitionistic theory. So if a disjunction is provable, then uh, either phi or psi is provable and similarly for an existential. As you see, you can find the natural number n, standard natural number n, such that phi of n is provable. But as I said, more in general, you want to work with the partial combinatorial algebra. So this is the short definition. You have a partial binary operation, and there are extra elements, so-called combinators, k and s, that satisfy these um, conditions. Now here, equality is clean equality. So uh, either both sides are undefined, or they are defined and equal. So if you look at K, you have K, A, B equals A. So in particular, K, A is defined and K, B is defined and equal to A. And uh, S, A, B is always defined and uh, S, A, B, C equals A, C, B, C. Now the usual convention is to drop uh, dots and parentheses whenever you can. And um, well, there are few facts that are true of any PCA that are relevant for applications to realizability. First of all, you have uh, pairing and uh, projection combinators that do what they are supposed to do. So PAB is always defined. And if you take P0 of PAB, you get back A, similarly for P1. Then uh, you have various forms of the recursion theorem. Uh, for instance, there is an element f such that f of a is always defined and uh, it's a fixed point for this equation. And uh, finally, in only PCA, in every PCA, you have a copy of the natural numbers and the uh, combinators, successor, predecessor, and definition by cases that do what they're supposed to do again. And uh, so for instance, you can use Karina, um, but in general, uh, yes. it's easier to directly define the embedding and corresponding combinators for, for example, in the, in the case of Fini for algebra, you're not gonna bother with carry numerals, you just use the natural numbers as the natural, as representatives of the natural numbers. Okay, so let me conclude with some examples. So we already seen Clini first algebra. Uh, we also have Clini second algebra on bare space with, Turing, with a continuous function application, various kinds of term models. Uh, the graph model is an example of total combinatory algebra, and uh, finally Scott's uh, model. Now, for applications to realizability, most of the time you get away with just Clini fourth and second algebra. Um, Scott model is an example, but as far as I know, there are no uh, applications to realizability, at least so far. 
Now it's about time to introduce the, the main character here, generic uh, uh, realizability. So um, generic, generic realizability is so called because <clears throat> basically you ignore, <clears throat> you ignore quantifiers. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so you say that quantifiers are treated uh, generically. So a proof of a for all is a proof of uh, any instance, phi of x, which is a pretty strong condition. But um, on the other hand, the proof of an existential is a proof of some instance. So in particular, A bears no information on, um, on this witness, on X. Uh, the good news is that at least as long as we are dealing with sets, uh, this kind of realizability works. So it doesn't work, for instance, with numbers. So take the number theoretic statement, every natural number is either zero or not. Well, you're not gonna find a generic realizer of that statement. But again, if you work with sets, then surprisingly, you can, uh, um, you can use generic realizability. Now you might wonder why do we do that? Well, uh, a sim there's a simple enough reason which is the following. Suppose you wanna work with, the, with your favorite PCA, okay? Like Clini Force Algebra. But the domain is, um, is big, the universe of sets. And uh, for instance, so you see you, you are stuck uh, and you cannot act, you cannot apply numbers to sets. You can only apply numbers to numbers. So this is, uh, this is one reason. And, um, this kind of interpretation was first used by Kreisel and Trestra in their interpretation of intuitionistic logic. Now, I wonder if you can hear me. Hello? Is everything fine? Yes. Okay. I hear you. <laughs> So um, Kreisel and Trestra. So they define a generic realizability for what's essentially intuitionistic uh, second order arithmetic and they use clean forced algebra. So as you see the clauses for set uh, quantifiers, I mean, set quantifiers are treated generically. Everything else is like in clean recursive realizability. And then, uh, okay, the atomic case involving membership uh, well, the realizer says something about uh, this membership, but um, okay. In the context of set theory, basically, if you transfer, if you generalize directly Kreisel and Trestra, you obtain a kind of realizability that, um, that works uh, but unfort unfortunately, it doesn't validate extensionality. Now, for application, this is not a big problem, as long as you can eliminate extensionality. And in some cases, you, you can, as shown by Friedman. Later, McCarthy refined this notion so as to validate also extensionality. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to uh, look at McCarthy version of generic realizability. Now, a natural question is, what do we mean by intuitionistic set theory? Well, that's not a simple question. For us, or for this talk, an intuitionistic set theory is just a theory that avoids classical logic. And uh, so you use intuitionistic logic and uh, you avoid principles that imply this could be middle. So two prominent examples are intuitionistic Zermelo-Frankel set theory and the constructive Zermelo-Frankel set theory. Now, IZF is uh, roughly ZF with intuitionistic logic. Now you have to make some adjustments. So induction instead of foundation, because the foundation is one of the bad guys, it gives you a screwed in middle. Now collection instead of replacement, 
because, uh, well, in ZF you can prove collection, but you use foundation in a crucial way and you don't have foundation. And finally, power set. Now it's known that ZF, classical ZF, is pi zero two conservative over IZF. So in particular, there is a negative translation between ZF and IZF as shown by uh, Friedman. So the strength of IZF is the strength, uh, is the same as ZF. Now a much weaker theory is the constructive Zermelo-Franker set theory. So the main changes here are bounded separation instead of full separation. Then uh, you require a stronger form of collection because you don't have full separation. And finally, you, you drop power set and you use a subset collection. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna say a lot about subset collection. It can, express, it can be expressed in other forms like fullness. Um, what I wanna say is that um, there is an interpretation of CZF, I mean, given by Axel into Martin Love type theory that validates subset collection. So that's why you have this axiom here. And uh, yeah, the strength of CZF is known to be uh, that of uh, second order arithmetic, so much weaker. Okay, and we are now ready to, to develop generic realizability for set theory. So this was done by McCarthy for SDF. And uh, then Ratian showed how to formalize and to make it work for CSF, CSF. So there are some issues as you will see. Now the ingredients are, you have a PCA, you're gonna define a domain V of A, domain of the interpretation, and then the realizability notion, real, relation. So A realizes phi, where phi has parameters in the domain, okay? Uh, now, the, the elements of the domain of VA are pretty much like the P names in, uh, in set theory. The, with the only exception that now we use a partial combinatorial algebra instead of a partial order. Now, uh, let me point out uh, um, the differences between IZF and CZF. So in IZF, you have power set, okay? So you can define VA alpha by recursion, by using power set, and then you take the union. Now in CZF, you don't have a, a power set, but you can still define v of, v of A inductively. So you can use inductive definitions. So in the end, the universe uh, consists of, uh, set of sets of pairs of the form AY with A in the PCA and Y in the universe. It's like P names. Uh, well, you just need to remember now that uh, a set in the universe consists of pairs where the first component comes from the PCA. Okay, that's all you need to remember. And, um, and then uh, here you go. So, so you define uh, uh, realizability by, by recursion on the formula. Now the atomic case is already a, um, an instance of uh, transfinite recursion. So you're gonna define that by transfinite recursion. That's okay. So for instance, uh, membership. So A proves X in Y, if for some Z in the universe, A zero Z is in Y and A one proves X equals Z. And uh, for equality, you add that whenever there is, you have an element of X of the form BZ, then A B first component proves Z in Y and vice versa if you have an element of Y. So let me just note the BHK character of these clauses, okay? And um, okay, when it comes to connectives, it's like in clean recursive realizability, set quantifiers unbounded are treated generically. And um, this, is the, this is not strictly necessary, but you can add uh, 
closes for bounded quantifiers. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, um, at least for bounded quantifiers, you sort of uh, recoup the um, BHK character of the interpretation. So for instance, a proof of for all X in Y, as you see, uh, is uh, an A such that whenever BX is in Y, AB is a proof of phi of X. So A act on elements of Y. Um, okay, the interpretation is sound. So this uh, generic uh, realizability as, as shown by McCarthy for IZF and Ratian for CZF. So let me give a brief sketch. Um, so I just wanna point out that uh, in, uh, for extensionality and equality, you make an essential use of the recursion theorem for PCAs. Now pairing and union are straightforward. For infinity, uh, you're gonna use your copy of natural number inside the PCA. So you have a canonical name for omega consisting of pairs uh, bar n dot n for n in omega, where you remember bar n is your um, representation of the natural number n inside your PCA. And uh, n dot is another name defined by recursion. Okay, now again, for induction, you use the recursion theorem. And uh, let me spend some words on separation now. Now, it's not important for you to understand this why here. Uh, you just need to know that you want to define this set y. And um, if you are in IZF, uh, there's no problem. You have full separation. Um, in CZF, um, this is not a bounded formula. So this one, B proves phi u or realizes phi u. It's not bounded, but um, well, it's almost bounded if you allow um, atomic formulas of this form. So A realizes X in Y and A realizes X, in, X equals Y. And this follows by general results. So the idea is that you can still use bounded comprehension in, a lang in an extended language with function symbols for definable functions, okay? It doesn't work with the relations, but as long as you have definable functions in your theory, you can use bounded compre comprehension in the extended language. Okay, that's all I wanna say about the proof of the soundness. Now, there is a variant with truth. And um, so the goal now is to define a universe, B of A, uh, in such a way that every set as a name gets named by something in B of A and uh, realizability implies true. So if phi is provable, remember phi as parameters in V of A, then uh, the evaluation of phi is true. Um, so phi circle here is just phi where you, you replace the parameters X uh, with, their, with their evaluation. So with X circle. Mm, now, the development, the definition of generic realizability with truth is due to Ratian. Now, mm, the definition of the universe, uh, well, it's not, uh, it looks like uh, over uh, complicated. Uh, but anyway, so the idea now is that uh, the universe consists of pairs, you know, X circle, X star. And um, X star, the second component, uh, is a subset of A times VA, such that whenever you take an element of X star, and you forget about the first component that comes from the PCA. And the evaluation of that pair, which is, which is just really the first component is an element of X circle. 
Okay, so the idea, if you write X circle and X star for fourth and second projection, the idea is that that pair in V of A is actually named for X circle. So that's your evaluation map. And the critical observation here is that, uh, well, elements of um, X star give names modulo your PCA, give names to elements of a circle, but not every element of a circle has a name coming from X star. And this is a crucial aspect uh, of, the, uh, of this definition. And uh, it has to do with comprehension, okay? So basically you have to allow for what I call here uh, partial names, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Where partial mean that this inclusion can be strict. And uh, okay, now you define realizability with truth. And the idea is that in every clause, uh, of generic realizability, you also add uh, phi circle. So you're also requiring phi to be true. So for instance, let's just look at the atomic case. So A proves X in Y. So it's a true realizer of X in Y. If first of all, that's true. So X circle is in Y circle. Remember, X circle is just the first component of X. X will be a pair. And um, the rest is like in uh, generic visibility without true. Now, we don't need to bother too much uh, with uh, the other clauses. The point is, uh, okay, by using generic realizability and its true variant, you get a bunch of uh, uh, applications. So for instance, uh, um, so T here can be either CZF or IZF. And both theories have the junction property. They have the numerical existence property, uh, consistency with church thesis and closure under the corresponding rule. Now, this one is interesting. You have this sort of uh, uniformity rule Okay, that fails, for instance, in, in arithmetic. But in set theory, if uh, let's say for all x uh, this disjunction holds, then actually it's for a trivial reason. So either for all x phi of x or for all x psi of x. Uh, notice that this rule is classically false. And uh, finally, Okay, I just wanted to put this, uh, uh, this result here where generic realizability is just one of the ingredients, but anyway, uh, you can show that CZF does not have the existent property. Um, anyway, this is some of the applications of uh, generic uh, realizability. Sometimes you have to combine with other tools, but anyway. Now, uh, so let me show you finally some, uh, some new work. Mm. So some is already published and uh, the rest is still in progress. Mm. So the starting point here is choice. What do we know about choice? Well, we know that full choice is one of the bad guys. Uh, full choice by result of Diaconesco implies excluded middle. Uh, the proof is silly, but um, you know, the proof of the, of the recursion theorem is silly. So that's how it is. But certain, certain forms of choice are still acceptable. Uh, we are talking about choice in uh, finite types or like the axiom of choice or dependent choice or countable choice in finite types. So you have here uh, a number of results and uh, they all point into the same direction. So essentially adding finite type choice 
uh, does not change uh, the, the set of prova probably recursive functions. And in some cases, it doesn't change uh, the arithmetical part of the theory. Uh, these results use an array of techniques, uh, including genetic realizability, but some uh, use proper uh, proof theoretic machinery like cat elimination. Now, while preparing the talk, I went actually to check some of the proofs and uh, in particular, this, the proof of this item here, which is a sort of a good, good man type uh, result for IZF, meaning, you know, arithmetic relativity. And um, I realized that the proof is actually wrong. No problem. Uh, the result is correct. But, uh, well, the reason why the proof uh, doesn't work, the proof doesn't work, is essentially the same reason that uh, led us to consider an extension of notion of generic realizability. So generic realizability doesn't work, but if you define this extension of version, that by the way works with any partial combinatorial algebra, then uh, you can get an interpretation of finite types choice. Uh, in particular, you get pi zero two conservativity. And uh, well, if you use greeny forced algebra, and you combine with uh, some sort of forcing like in goodman bison then you obtain arithmetic conservativity. So in one, two, uh, slash two steps, you basically reprove and actually improve all these results. Okay, and the other good news is that, um, well, with this, uh, tool of extension of genetic uh, uh, realizability, you might deal with stronger forms of choice, not just finite type choice. So what I'm saying is there, there's room for improvement, okay? But uh, anyway, let me remind you what finite types are. Um, well, type zero objects are the natural numbers and the type sigma to tau objects are the functions from type sigma to type tau objects. Now, if you are in set theory, in the language of set theory, you're gonna have a way of expressing, um, of defining these sets, and in particular to, to write down this formula here. So choice for type sigma and tau, which says, well, if you have a total relation from type sigma to type tau objects, then you have a choice function of type sigma to tau, okay? Now, why generic realizability doesn't work? Well, it works for up to certain types. Uh, it works for some choice, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't validate uh, um, choice in all finite types, as long as, uh, I mean, if you want to use an arbitrary partial combinatory algebra, like Clini for algebra, then there's no, there's no way to validate uh, all choice. But anyway, again, what does it mean to, to realize choice? Well, you know, these uh, finite type quantifiers are actually uh, defined. So if uh, you have this formula theta sigma defining f, f of sigma, then uh, for instance, uh, uh, for all x of type sigma, you can read that as uh, for every set z, if z is the set of type sigma object, then for all x in z, okay. And um, ultimately the challenge is to find canonical names for the f sigma and uh, realizers for uh, the formula saying that F sigma is uh, what it's supposed to be. So dot F zero is the set of natural number and uh, dot F sigma tau is the set of functions from dot F sigma to dot F tau and finally choice for these uh, names. Now the plan, remember, we're working with a generic, with an arbitrary PCA. 
So our plan is to build a copy of HEO and to define names consisting entirely of elements of the PCA. So in particular, these names have nothing to do with the real, with the real world, with the, real, uh, with the actual F of sigma. That's okay. Uh, now we have this equivalence relation between uh, of type sigma between elements of A. So you say that A equals zero B if uh, A, B are equal to some natural number N. And uh, for type sigma tau, you say that A and B are equal as, object, as elements of type sigma tau if they send uh, equal elements of type sigma to equal elements of type tau. And then you can say that an element of the PCA is type sigma if uh, A equals sigma A. <clears throat> now, uh, well, it's time to rely to define realizability, extensional realizability. So you have pairs of realizers, not just one realizers. And the idea is that A and B are equal to realizer of phi. Well, we know what to do with connectives and quantifiers. Uh, the, the critical case is the atomic case. Uh, and to do that, uh, we also uh, modify the universe. So you remember in generic realizability, the, the elements of the universe, of the domain of the interpretation, uh, are sets of pairs, where the first component is an element of the PCA. Now, the universe will consist of um, sets of triples, A, B, X, where A, B are in the PCA and X is a, is a name, is an element of the universe. Now, let's just look at the, the fourth clause. That everything else is pretty standard. So the fourth clause is, um, a and B are equal realizer of, of X and Y if for some name from some element of the universe Z, basically the first projections give you an element of Y and the second projections are equal realizers of X equals Z, okay? Okay, if you want the implication A and B equally realize phi implies psi, if uh, whenever C, D are equal realizers of phi, A, C and B, D are defined and equal realizers of psi. Okay, if you write uh, just A realizes phi, you actually mean that A equals A realize phi. Now, how you define these canonical names, as I said, uh, for the F sigma? Well, you use this copy of HEO, okay? So dot F sigma consists now of triples, A, B, A sigma, where A and B are equal as elements uh, of type sigma, and uh, <clears throat> A sigma is a name defined by recursion on the type. Now, um, for a natural number n, a zero is the set of triples, uh, m, m, b, actually b zero, where b is equal to m and m is less than n. So this definition by recursion on n, and uh, for type sigma tau, then A sigma to tau will consist of triples, CD where C equal D modulo sigma, and uh, <clears throat> this component here is, is the pair inside the universe, C sigma E tau where AC equals E. So remember that A sends object of type sigma to object of type tau. So this is well defined. Okay, with this uh, 
with this notion of realizability extension and with these names, you can show finally that uh, basically <clears throat> you can realize choice. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. So that's it for this part. So now um, the rest of the talk is, uh, as I said, work in progress. And uh, the, the question uh, is the following. So we, we ask whether uh, IZF or CZF is closed under certain rules. So the corresponding rule of choice for finite types. So if uh, this is, if this is a total relation from type sigma to type tau, then there is a choice function. And, uh, and then we, we look at various forms of independence of premise. <clears throat> so independence of premise, which is a classically uh, valid, true, uh, is, uh, but not intuitionistically, is of the form, uh, well, if, uh, phi of x implies that there is an object of type sigma such that psi, and now y does not occur in phi, then you can actually pull that quantifiers in front of the formula. Now, intuitionistically, this is okay as long as you have some restriction of phi, why in particular you don't wanna have existentials in phi. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, how do we show this? Well, we have defined generic realizability with truth, right? And the truth variant of realizability is usually the one that gives you uh, closure on the rules. <clears throat> but now we wanna work with the, with the, not just with any partial combinatorial algebra, we wanna work with the PCA that has something to say about uh, objects of finite types, okay? And uh, so we have this notion of PCA over um, bold F. So bold F is a set of objects of finite types. <clears throat> so um, F is uh, contained in A. So you have a copy of uh, the objects of finite type inside A, and, um, and the application is compatible with function application. See, if you have an object, of, an object of type sigma tau and an object of type sigma, then you can, act, you can compute f of, it, f of x, and you want that to be equal to f dot x, where this is the, the operation on A. <clears throat> But in general, you want to have an embedding on f into a that preserves a function application. This is pretty natural, you know. Uh, so again, we know that we always have a copy of the natural numbers inside every PCA, but in general, you don't have a copy of all objects of finite type. So let's ask for that. <clears throat> And the challenge is uh, basically the same as before. Now you have to find names for the F sigma and the realizers for these formulas. <clears throat> now, since we are working with the generic realizability with truth, well, we already know that the canonical name for F sigma will be a pair where the first component is uh, the, the real F sigma, okay? So remember, in generic realizability with truth, you have a, a pair, which is a name for the first component. So this will be a name for F sigma. And uh, there is a natural way of defining canonical names now, if you have a PCA over F. So dot F sigma will be a pair consisting of F sigma, and then uh, <clears throat> the second component will be indexed by F sigma. So it will be a set of pairs, X bar, X dot, where X bar is in your PCA, 
and X dot is defined rec recursively on the type. <clears throat> So let's look at uh, an object of type uh, sigma to tau. So the canonical name for that object is the pair. First component is the object itself. And the second component is basically the graph. The graph of the, the function um, with, the, with the tag, for any pair, you have a tag uh, in the PCA, okay? But X, uh, for X of type sigma is an element of the PCA. So you're keeping track of uh, these pairs. Anyway, long story short, uh, no, it's not so short. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, we are looking at a choice. So what I wanna say is this uh, names behave uh, very well. And in fact, we can prove that um, the names for objects of finite type, as well as their extensions are bijectively presented. <clears throat> that in particular means that uh, they are, you have a bijective uh, correspondence between the name, sorry, between uh, the set X and some subset of the partial combinatorial algebra. <clears throat> so you have a copy of your set inside the PCA. To be more precise, if you have a name of this form, you say that is bijectively presented if uh, <clears throat> Every element of the X circle <clears throat> gets a name from an element of X star. So you remember, usually you have an inclusion, but now you're requiring that every element has a name. And then the second, <clears throat> sorry. And the second condition is the following. So if you look at the second component X star, and you consider two pairs. So remember, A, B are element of the PCA and U and V are names. Then you want that if A equals B, then uh, this U and V name the same set. And vice versa, if they name the same set, actually A equals B. In other words, you have a bijection from a subset of A to X circle given by uh, the following set of pairs. So for any element, element of X star of the form AU, you consider A and the evaluation of U, which is just the first component. So that gives you a function, first of all. I mean, it's not always a function, but so it's a function, it's one-to-one -one and on two X circle. Now, um, so every dot, every dot of sigma is bijectively presented. And uh, the thing is that you can prove choice for bijectively presented names. So if you have a realizer of uh, say a total relation from X to Y, where X and Y are bijectively presented, then you can actually find a function from uh, the evaluation of X to the evaluation of Y. So a choice function, okay? So it remains to, to show that you have realizers for the, for the formulas defining F of Sigma. And for that, we need uh, something more, okay? So we also require our PCA not just to contain a copy of the of every object of finite type, but to be extensive. Uh, what do we mean is, uh, so if you fix the uh, type sigma and tau, you're gonna have an, an extra combinator, I sigma tau, such that uh, basically, if you have an element A of the PCA 
that sends objects of type sigma to objects of type tau. So extensionally, A defines an object of type sigma to tau, then uh, I sigma tau recovers that, uh, that function, okay? So this is a further property. Mm. Okay, but the good news is that if you have an extensive PCA over F, then you can realize that your canonical names are, are good. And uh, in particular, you get the closure under the rule of choice by using extensive PCA over F. And uh, by the way, you also show the closure under this uniformity rule for any type sigma. So if for every set X, there is a Y of type sigma, then actually you can switch the quantifiers, which is quite something. Okay. And um, so we conclude, uh, we just have to, to look at independence of premise. Now in this context, set theory, you can actually distinguish between two kinds of independence. So the first uh, is the one where you can uh, just pull uh, the type sigma quantifier, existential quantifier in front of the formula. And the second one, the second rule with the same premise just says that uh, there is a set Y such that on the assumption that the premise holds, then you can recognize as an object of type sigma, okay? So you don't, you don't have this kind of behavior in finite arithmetic where you know, you're working with already with finite type quantifiers. <clears throat> so everything is uh, an object of finite type, but here you have also sets. So this rule here makes sense. And uh, finally, we can prove the following, but some are still conjectures. conjectures. Uh, the first two rules are um, <clears throat> independence of premise for negated uh, premises. So if the premise is negated, then we can actually pull the existential quantifier all the way uh, here. And as you see, Y does not depend on X. By the way, we can only say that Y is some set. Now, the second rule, uh, when you ask that the premise is non this premise here, not phi of X is actually non-empty, so you can prove that there is, a, there is an instance of not phi of x. And then you can pull the type sigma quantifiers in front. <clears throat> and again, it does not depend on x. <clears throat> and these two rules uh, are um, independence of premise for universal premises. Now, rule three, you have a <clears throat> universal set quantifier. So for every set Z and the, the matrix theta is decidable. Then again, you can pull the type sigma quantifier in front. In this rule, you have a, a universal quantifier of a given type the matrix is still decidable. And what you can do is to find a set Y. And if the premise holds, then Y, you can set Y is, is of the type Sigma. Okay. Now for <clears throat> items one and four, the ones where you see you just, uh, prove the existence of a set Y, you actually need a, a total extensive PCA. 
And uh, the totality requirement is, uh, <clears throat> well, we don't know if we have a total extensive PCA, okay? We, so the question is, why well, I put the first one just for completeness, but we know the answer. The, the question is, if there is an extensive PCA over F, and if you can prove it in C of F, and uh, the answer to, the, to both questions is yes, okay. There are way of a constructive extensive PCA over F. <clears throat> But the questions for uh, total extensive PCA, that does not have an answer so far. What we can do, and you can do it in CZF, is to build the total PCA over F uh, by using basically the model construction, the graph model construction, but uh, that's not extensive. So what's the message here? Uh, as long as we know that in CZF we can actually build a total extensive PCA, then we are sure that um, we have the closure under some of these independence of premise rules. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, so, is there any questions or comments? So, if, okay. okay, so it, Okay, if there's no question, uh, yes, let's, uh, let's thank the speaker again. So, so customary in, in, in this seminar, so we will move on the, to the breakout rooms for free discussion. If you are uh, not interested in free 